From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Renewed calls for border security over a DACA deal. Cronkite News is in Washington tracking the latest battle over immigration reform. Plus, the latest on massive federal sanctions against Wells Fargo Bank and how the company is hoping to rebuild trust. And mine workers and activists march at the state capitol to keep a Navajo power plant from shutting down. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Tyler Paley. And I'm Noelle Lilly. Thank you for joining us. Congress and the White House continue to negotiate an immigration reform package as a March deadline looms for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, program. And today, President Trump said he welcomes a shutdown if Democrats don't give him a deal. If we don't get rid of these loopholes where killers are allowed to come into our country and continue to kill, if we don't change it, let's have a shutdown. We'll do a shutdown, and it's worth it for our country. One group of advocates was in Washington today to demand that immigration enforcement come before any deal on DACA. Ariana Bustos reports from our Washington bureau. For grieving mom Marianne Mendoza, there's no middle ground on immigration reform. There is no compromise to get border security. That, that should be a standalone issue. Um, it is for the safety of the American people, and we have a right to have a secure border. Every country has immigration laws, and we have a right to have ours upheld and to stop the flow of people invading our country. Mendoza is the mother of Brandon Mendoza, a Mesa sergeant who was killed in 2014 by a drunken driver who was in the country illegally. She was one of several mothers who shared similar emotional stories today. This is my son. This is all I have left of my family, his ashes. And the same message to Washington. No deal on DACA unless the border is secure. Sheriff A.J. Lauterbach of Jackson County, Texas, says he is sympathetic to Dreamers, but they have to answer for their parents' actions. The parents of the children brought across have done a tremendous disservice to those folks, uh, to those children. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of, of, the, of, a, of a pathway to citizenship, but I can accept a deal if we secure this country to a, to a point where American citizens uh, have a greater degree of security. Lauterbach says it's common sense. And I've used the example several times before about if your parents robbed the bank of a million dollars and 10 years later a case was made, uh, would those children have to give the money back? And the answer is yes. Mendoza says she would be okay with a deal after the border is secure if a dreamer can prove their value. Contributing to our society, the best of the best coming from other countries, then prove to us, put them through the proper vetting, make sure there is no criminal background, and, um, you know, make them go through that process every two years to be able to stay in the program. In Washington, Ariana Bustos, Cronkite News. Arizona Senator John McCain has introduced a bipartisan immigration bill that would keep Dreamers in the U.S. while also providing funds for border security. Reporter Sidney Eisenberg talked with Valley activists about the proposal. Indivisible Phoenix has protested outside of Senator Jeff Flake's office every Tuesday for the past 55 weeks. Today, they are switching their tune and instead saying thank you to Senator John McCain. It's noisy as protesters gather again outside of Senator Flake's office. Today, a new sign hangs in the mix. A thank you to Arizona Republican Senator John McCain. Senator McCain and Delaware Democratic Senator Chris Coons proposed a bill yesterday that would provide a path to citizenship for dreamers who have been in the U.S. since 2013, while also securing the southern border. Mary Santee says she is happy that senators are working to keep dreamers in the U.S. I, I just like his position. He's not saying that we necessarily need a wall to protect dreamers, but we, we number one is we need to protect dreamers. It's a humanitarian thing to do. During the State of the Union address, President Trump said he would provide a path to citizenship, but only for 1.8 million people. With a government shutdown deadline looming for Congress, the president says he will not budge on border security. Without borders, we don't have a country. So would I shut it down over this issue? Yes. Leonard Rubidoux had a layover in Phoenix and decided to join the protest. He says he is sad DACA recipients and Dreamers have been put in the middle of this argument. They're just good, hard-working people. 
they understand what it means to be an American and to be productive. Santee believes that while this bill comes close to a resolution, not everyone, including people with her same views, will be satisfied. I don't think anybody here uh, really would agree exactly on everything. Now the goal of this bill is to have agreement on key issues before the end of the DACA program on March 5th. However, Congress must also come up with a short-term spending bill in order to prevent a government shutdown with an even closer deadline of this Friday. In the Broadcast Center, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. The Dow regained ground today after the steepest drop in six and a half years. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained back almost half of what it lost yesterday. It closed up more than 560 points. This is the biggest point gain since August of 2015. Banks took a hit in the markets after the Federal Reserve brought sanctions against Wells Fargo on Friday. Now, Wells Fargo is working to reassure its customers. Shelby Lindsay reports from Washington. Wells Fargo CEO Tim Sloan took a reassuring tone in a message to the bank's customers this week. The order is not related to Wells Fargo's financial condition. We remain one of the nation's soundest financial institutions with strong levels of capital and liquidity. Wells Fargo is on a path to rebuild trust and ensure that we are serving you well. The Federal Reserve action Friday was in response to the revelation last year that Wells Fargo employees opened up 2 million fake accounts. Wells Fargo will replace four board members and is restricted from growth until the company improves on governance and controls. Ed Merzwinski of the Public Research Group called the sanctions a huge statement by the Federal Reserve. And Merzwinski wonders whether our banks are getting too big to manage. Ed wasn't only speaking to those 15 or 18 Wells directors. They were speaking to every bank director in the country. Is the banking system still safe? Well, the regulators have to take action, and this should give the people of Arizona a little bit more confidence that at least somebody is watching Wells Fargo and therefore also watching other banks. Although the Federal Reserve placed sanctions on Friday, Sloan said the company has been making improvements since last year. It's important to note that these are not new matters. We have made significant progress in addressing these issues with more work underway. But Marzwinski said there's still work to be done. The new board is going to have to look much more closely over the shoulder of management. In Washington, I'm Shelby Lindsay, Cronkite News. In the Arizona legislature, House Bill 2222 is up for debate. The bill would give women in prison unlimited access to feminine hygiene products. Currently, women are given 12 pads per month and they have to pay for any additional products they need. This bill, introduced by State Representative Athena Salmon, would give $80,000 to state funding for unlimited access to pads for inmates. A group of bipartisan lawmakers introduced a bill to extend the state's non-discrimination protections to gay and transgender Arizonans. This is the first time a bill of its kind has bipartisan support. Currently, there are no statewide laws to protect gay and transgender individuals from being fired, denied housing, or refused service. The Hispanic Chamber of Commerce says that in 2017, there were about 4.8 million Hispanic-owned businesses in the U.S., including more than 123,000 here in Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Alexis Burdine shows us how Arizona's Latinas are expanding their businesses. <laughs> It's a one-woman show kind of day inside of Linda Valenzuela's salon. Completamente no, me dijo, me gusta que me quede. The business owner and stylist tends to clients as she keeps her shop up and running. Valenzuela is one of thousands of Hispanic female business owners making their mark across the valley. And she says her culture actually gives her an advantage. Because I'm Hispanic and I speak both languages, I'm able to work in both markets. According to the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, among Latina business owners, 76% are bilingual, compared to 21% of non-Latina women business owners. 
Stephanie Vasquez, owner of Fair Trade Cafe, says that for her, being a Hispanic woman in business hasn't been specifically a challenge, but the process of owning a shop has not always been easy. I didn't have mentorship. I didn't have some sort of example to follow through. So this was really, I'm, I'm a one woman show. According to the U.S. Census, nationally, Latinas are the fastest growing segment of business owners. Monica Villalobos is one of them. What I've observed from other women business owners is that we are driven, we're motivated. Um, all we're looking for is the opportunity and we're ready to move forward and, as I said, really reshape the landscape of business. Monica tells me that the number of Hispanic women-owned businesses within the Valley is expected to continue to grow. We've seen 116 percent growth from 2007 to 2015. In Phoenix, Alexis Burdine, Cronkite News. The Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce says the number of Hispanic women entrepreneurs has tripled between 2007 and 2015. A lack of fast internet services could affect the way students learn. That's right. Coming up on Cronkite News, a federal program gave Yavapai County almost $2 million to increase broadband access. Plus, how Valley Community Colleges and their student athletes are dealing with the decision to cut all football programs. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. It's a tough choice. Take a new job far from home or face unemployment. That's the decision facing hundreds of employees of the Navajo Generating Station. Cronkite News reporter Jamie Fossenkemper was at the state capitol today, where the workers were rallying to keep the plant running. And I'm here for the long, long haul. And I'm here to battle, as long as you guys will battle with me. Myron Richardson, welding supervisor for the Navajo Generating Station, was one of the hundreds of union mine workers, tribal members, and families from northern Arizona who marched to the state capitol today. They wanted to show their support of keeping the power plant near Page up and running. According to Salt River Project, the Navajo Generating Station has provided electricity to millions of people and businesses in the southwest for 47 years. Last year, officials from the Navajo Nation and Salt River Project decided to shut down the plant. But over uh, time, it, it just became very clear to SRP and the other owners that, that operating the plant beyond 2019 did not make economic sense. But the union says that decision puts hundreds of people out of a job. Where is the nation going to be in the 400, 600, or however many jobs that are there? Those jobs are hard, will be very hard to replace. Going forward, SRP will be providing jobs for those affected by the shutdown, but those who choose to take the Salt River project up on their offer will have to leave Navajo County. And if SRP is trying to provide jobs, yeah, I'm interested, but um, I'll really like to stay right where I'm at. In Phoenix, Jamie Fossenkemper, Cronkite News. Those who choose not to leave Navajo Nation will be offered severance packages. Schools across the U.S. face the challenge of incorporating new technology into their curriculum each year. But for rural areas that lack sufficient access to broadband, a much larger issue is at hand. As part of our Access Across Arizona initiative to bring you news from every county in the state, Cronkite News reporter Megan Meyer takes us to Yavapai County and an elementary school in Congress, Arizona, to see how they have tackled this broadband access problem. 
In a small town just outside of Prescott, the simple luxury of internet access can be difficult to come by. But now with funding from a federal E-rate program, Congress Elementary is able to move its students into the digital age. I use technology every day in class. Congress, Arizona, population 4,821, and residents only have 1.5% of the FCC's recommended bandwidth. That's made it hard for students in Caitlin Hunt's first grade class to connect and use technology. But the nonprofit group Education Superhighway is helping schools find resources to increase their internet access. By utilizing this federal funding, we were able to, to put in a request for fiber builds out into communities that have never received it before. Just last year, Yavapai County's request was approved. The county received $1.8 million from the FCC's E-rate program. Already, the money is helping students close the internet access gap. For them to be able to take initiative to walk around the classroom with the QR code app and be responsible and independent with that, I mean, I think that is just, just rewarding. You can tell they love technology. The tools you see being used by students and the Wi-Fi that keeps them running at fast speeds are 80% paid for by the E-rate program. This has allowed many schools within Yavapai County to bring in new devices. That's wonderful. Good. To find that mechanism that we could pay for this and finally bring the broadband out to these locations, I feel like we've really accomplished the mission that we've set out to do about five, six years ago. This is a day and age of, you know, where these kids know how to run tablets and they're six years old and they enjoy that. They don't even know that they're learning. In Congress, Megan Meyer, Cronkite News. The project to bring fiber lines over mountains and under railroad tracks for the Congress Elementary District allows homes and businesses to connect to the lines as well. Speaking of rural routes, the Pony Express is set to ride again tomorrow in the Far East Valley. Drivers from Scottsdale to Holbrook may see Pony Express reenactment riders carrying mail along the state highways through the west of the week. The Navajo County Sheriff's Posse has been staging this 200-mile ride for nearly 60 years. The Hash Knife Pony Express riders will stop at post offices in Eber Overgard, Payson, and Fountain Hills en route to their final destination. They'll arrive in Old Town Scottsdale Saturday at high noon. The East Valley of Arizona is getting a new name thanks to the East Valley Partnership. The Phoenix East Valley includes the cities of Tempe, Chandler, Mesa, Queen Creek, and Apache Junction. The East Valley Partnership pushed for this new name to bring more visitors to the area after the success of changing the name of Mesa Gateway Airport to the Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport in 2007. Making healthy choices can be hard while running a classroom. Coming up on Cronkite News, a new app helps teachers be healthier by letting them order nutritious meals. And our temperatures are dropping back down into the 70s. I'll tell you when, coming up. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. When you think of healthy school lunches, it's usually the students who are the focus. But the Buckeye High School District started a program for its teachers and staff. Cronkite News reporter Michaela Moorhead shows us how it's working. Lost weight. <laughs> I am eating much healthier. Changing habits can be hard, but the Buckeye School District started a wellness program for teachers and staff. Using Nutrislice, a mobile app, 
teachers and staff in the program can order and receive customized healthy lunches. There are a variety of different food options ranging from kale salad to salmon and quinoa. We want to make sure that we offer those different options. So there are vegetarian options. Um, we can make a gluten-free menu so they can also order those items. They can put a special request in there and we can definitely do that. And they also have an option if they want to do vegan. They give me their input on things that they would like to see on the, the wellness menu on the Nutrislice app and I, I will find items that will you know, fit their needs. On average, employees order from the app 10 to 15 times a week, according to Shriver. The app also links to employees' Fitbits and can track eating, sleeping, and working out habits. Already, many teachers and staff would agree the program is helping change their lifestyles for the better. It helps you to be very conscious and aware of your sleep habits, your workout habits, your eating habits. Um, just very much aware. I work out more now than I ever have. The teacher wellness program also reminds the staff to make annual checkups, including eye exams and dental appointments. In Buckeye, Michaela Moorhead, Cronkite News. The Chard Wells also has a program for students, and the wellness program is already serving more than 4,000 at four different schools in the district. These temperatures in the mid-80s make it feel like spring is already here. Yeah, they certainly do, but a change is on the horizon. Courtney Malley is in our Weather Center tracking our forecast. Thanks, Tyler. Let's take a look at the high and low temperature that we hit today. We hit 80 degrees earlier this afternoon and 53 degrees for a little bit chilly of a start for your morning. Those temperatures are going to stay in the low to mid 80s during your week because of this high pressure system that we're feeling from the West Coast. However, as the week progresses, that is going to change. As your day starts tomorrow, we're going to hit 78 degrees for our high temperature in Phoenix, 52 degrees in Flagstaff, 55 in the Grand Canyon, 63 in Prescott, and 77 down south in both Casa Grande and Tucson. As for your seven-day forecast, the next few days are going to be clear, sunny, and bright. So if you have some time, step outside and feel that heat. As the weekend starts, your, that low-pressure system is coming into town, so it's going to be a little breezy on Saturday, and there is a slight chance of rain on Sunday. For Cronkite weather, I'm Courtney Malley. Major budget cuts in the Maricopa County Community College District mean saving money. But it also means the end of four football programs. Coming up on Cronkite News, the impact of the funding decision on coaches and players. Nights at 5 on Arizona PBS. Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for At Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS.
Maricopa County Community Colleges will terminate its district-sponsored football programs at the four schools that currently have them, Scottsdale, Phoenix, Mesa, and Glendale. Monday's decision is drawing mixed reactions on both sides. But as I found out, one thing is clear. This was a decision that all parties wish never had to be made. Injury made Division I schools hesitant to offer Phil Aholt a scholarship to play football. Turning lemons into lemonade, Aholt instead played football at Scottsdale Community College. But now, the situation has become sour. Arizona's biggest community college district is terminating each of its football programs after the 2018 season. There's a host of reasons that go along with this. Uh, you know, the financial constraints that we face right now, the leveling off of, of enrollment at all of our colleges, uh, as well as the lack of uh, the zeroing out of state funding for capital improvements. It's part of a national trend that has seen a decline in junior college football programs. Of the 530 programs in the National Junior College Athletic Association, just 65 field football teams. Here in the Valley, Hassan estimates it would take between 20 and $25 million over the next three to five years for football funding alone. Former Arizona State head coach Todd Graham heavily recruited out of community colleges and thinks the district's elimination of the programs sets a bad precedent. I think it's a, it's a sad day because a lot of kids are going to miss out on a lot of opportunities that they've had in the past uh, that they won't have moving forward. And Aholt feels the looming situation is unfair to those wanting a chance at the junior college level. Four community colleges all have close to uh, 80 to 100 kids on them. That's 400 young men right there with uh, not necessarily knowing what they're going to do uh, post high school. Now, Hassan tells Cronkite News no other sports programs will be affected by this decision, and he could not speculate about whether or not football could return to MCCC in the future. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.